as we were saying, which is uh, coming back after nearly six years. And uh, but let me let me start the conversation. I want to start it by telling you how we met for the first time. Some of you are aware that uh, international networks of participatory research had begun in 1977, about 40 years ago. When I came back to India after completing my PhD and was at National Labor Institute here, I started a network of participatory research in Asia. And that network became the basis for Priya. And that's why we have the same identity. As a network, we convene an international consultation on participatory research in then Yugoslavia, Ljubljana, in April 1980. And uh, I met John then, and also met Miles Horton. Uh, Miles Horton was the founder of uh, Highlander Research and Education Center in Tennessee, in the US. And, uh, that meeting with John and Miles uh, inspired me so much that I decided to visit the Highlander Center in 1981. At that time, Priya was being formed, but had not taken any program or shape. And uh, I was reflecting this morning that what, what were the influences of Highlander Center in that first visit before Priya was born. And uh, I came across three things. Highlander Center was a research and education center which hosted learning opportunities for social activists. And Miles uh, himself had been involved in adult education, vocal education work earlier. So I learned there the meaning of residential learning workshops. In the Highlander Center, while I was there, there was a residential workshop going on. The second thing I learned was the process by which all the participants would share their experience and facilitators like John and others would help systematize that sharing so that a common knowledge emerged. I was very impressed with that methodology. And third, I saw the use of culture, music. Some of you may know that We Shall Overcome was composed in Atlanta Center. And uh, they would sing, they would dance, and they would share and protest and learn from each other. So, I don't know if I told you this, but I I was thinking about this morning and I said, those three things stayed with me. And we tried to include them as we as educational efforts started. That's how. Interesting. Now all three of those principles were very important. Miles helped start this residential training center in a rural area. Um, you came in 81. He yeah. started this in 1932. And he had studied sociology. He had studied uh, adult education. He had been influenced by liberation theology. Mm -hmm. And they came back and were donated some land and built a small center. And it's in one of the poorest parts of the United States at the time, a very poor mining area. And they started to invite people and do workshops. And he used to say after the first few years, it wasn't going well. People didn't seem to be engaging, they weren't getting response, and so on. 
And, and they did a reflection, they, these were all sort of academics. They said, we realized that we were very good as academics at coming up with the answers to the problems we thought people ought to have. Not asking them what are their problems and starting where they are. A fundamental principle of adult education, of Priya's educational work, of participatory stuff. Start with the questions that people have, not the question that you think is most important and the answer that you think is most important. And then this principle was very simple. You bring people together who share common problems and experiences and allow them to talk about them in a safe space. And from that collective process, mm -hmm. then perhaps the solutions will mm -hmm. emerge. And therefore, that residential setting was very important he, he always used to say that Highlanders, and this is a challenge in Korea and, and in the current world where now over 50% of the population is urban. He always said it had to be in a rural area because people were going to stay in our center and interact and sleep and play and dance and all those things. There was no place for them to go. They couldn't go out in the evenings and, and, and so on. So he said learning was the total of learning. People ate together, they cooked together, they washed dishes together. And you know, there's a very famous story. One of our most famous graduates was uh, Rosa Parks. And you'll know Rosa Parks as the woman who's famous for, she's called now the mother of the American Civil Rights Movement because of her active civil disobedience in Alabama. But she had come to Highlander earlier. And we used to ask Rosa Parks, we used to interview her and say, what did you learn in Highlander? She said, I just, to be honest, I don't remember anything that we talked about in the workshop. She said, what I remember is I came and I was treated as an equal person with everybody else. We slept in the same room, you know, the same conditions. We, we ate together, we even washed dishes together. And she used to say, we would sit there and it didn't matter if you had a PhD or a no D. Mm. We, our knowledge was equal. So there was something about creating that environment right. which was just as important to the learning process as the, the technical knowledge or the technical expertise and the content. It was about treating people with dignity um, and recognizing through culture that you know they, they see the dance express technology in yeah. any way. And I remember coming here to India for the first time with you and we went to a, a workshop and told this We Shall Overcome story, and then We Shall Overcome was being sung back in so many different even languages, languages within yeah. India. Yeah. And that's a very good example, I think, about the power of people's culture. It's like Rajesh said, that song, that song was written, it was a traditional spiritual, and it was first jotted down in a workshop, and these were uneducated, illiterate tobacco workers, women tobacco workers. We read a workshop talking about their economic rights. And they started singing the song. And Miles Gordon's first wife was a music musician, music college, and she jotted it down. And then it spread. And now it's spread, it spread all over the world uh, as kind of a symbol for, for hope and, and social movement and social struggle. But it all came from that same philosophy that the answers, the music, the culture will come from, from the people. And for me, your visit was very important. That first experience in Lumiana was very important um, because I, I had graduated from Oxford. I had a PhD. I, I came back to the center, and they said, start a research program. And, and these philosophies were in contradiction, right? Because in my PhD, I had been taught that I was the expert. And this was a place that says that knowledge and the answers come from the people, not the experts. And so the first few years, I was trying to figure out how do you do a research program that's not based on your expertise, but is starting on helping people develop the answers for themselves. And we were trying a few things. And one day, Bud Hall showed up. Um, you all know Bud. And, and this was in 1977, before the Lubyana meeting. And he said, what you're doing has a name. It's called participatory research. And we're having a meeting. You should come. That's where I first met Rajesh. But it was also very important because we realized then that what we were trying to do, what other people were also trying to do, a new way of thinking about research and, and knowledge production. 
So that was very affirming for us to realize that, uh, <coughs> that we were part of a global, emerging global movement. Yeah. Now it's important to mention that we constantly reiterate that valuing people's knowledge is an important element of our research research. And this is what my said, we practice in all this life. Um, we invited uh, John and Juliet, his partner, who were at Highlander Center to come and spend uh, three months in Priya, January to March 1984. At that time, Priya was in Senate Farm, sort of rural Delhi. And uh, they came with their two young kids and spent uh, three months with us. And in that period, we were beginning to formulate relevance of participatory research to emerging movements of people. So there were two things we picked up because both those things, John and Juliet had been working on in the Highlander Center as well. Uh, one was the uh, use of participatory research methodology to study problems of land alienation. Land alienation at that time, not just through displacement due to dams, but also urbanization, uh, industrialization. Uh, and, uh, and the second thing was uh, with trade unions, workers, uh, use of participatory research in occupational health and safety. And um, one of the most interesting things that happened in that period, uh, you know, John and Juliet came with a video machine. And in those days, the video machine was very heavy. And, uh, and they, all those three months, wherever we went, they took videos, we played back, we listened. And those of you who know the history of training of trainers program, use of video as a learning tool during the training program was triggered by uh, the experience that we had uh, with John and Juliet at that time. So we, we learned from you very important use of a somewhat equalizing methodology in that sense. You, know? mm -hmm. you, you take, take uh, people's voice, you record it, and then play it back to them. In a way, give it back to them. Yeah. It was far more powerful than paper. Yeah. And, uh, now that was a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful visit for, for us. We were here with two small children I was reflecting on how much had changed when I arrived at the International Airport the other day. We arrived before the old airport. It was all very chaotic. We brought a trunk load of material to share, training materials from Highlander to share with Priya. And I think then you, you, you were in two rooms there at Sanitary Farm and yeah. here's in Sackett. Last night driving through Sackett, I saw the Hilton and the Sheraton and the malls. It was all very different. From living there. But then, you know, to do what you can do on your iPhone today, we were carrying 50 pounds worth of gear. And uh, we had batteries, we had tapes, we had all, all of this. And we were traveling all over India on the trains, uh, participating in these, I remember, very powerful residential workshops. The one that we did at Sayaman there on yeah. land, the one that we did on occupational disease with workers in Mumbai. Um, we went to Arissa, yeah. we went to Kanpur, all over the place carried this, this video. And that that use of the, we did a workshop even then with Seema Patel and women from, before Spark was even created, yeah. Yeah. Um, with women slum dwellers on how to use video to record your own experiences. And one of the powerful things about video was, we used to call it the restitution of people's own knowledge. Mm -hmm. There was something about hearing people's stories and playing it back to them on the screen gave it some new validity, some new way of understanding. And then hearing people's stories and sharing with other people who had similar stories was a way of spreading the value and affirmation. 
of that time. And then the most powerful use of that came immediately after we went back and around the boat off the edge. Maybe John will get into the next chapter, but you know, it was um, very important for us that we had been here working on seeing the issues of occupational disease here. And also, we were working on similar issues in the United States. And then the Bhopal disaster happened in 1985. <coughs> December 84. Oh, December 84. And still today, of course, this is the largest example of, of a toxic uh, chemical massacre anywhere. And immediately, the Indian, the U.S. media said the problem in Bhopal was that Indian workers didn't know how to use American technology. It was a blaming the workers for the problem. Now, the mother of that factory in Bhopal was in a very poor area in the region that we worked in. And this was a primarily white region, but this was a black community. So they would only put the most dangerous plants in the poorest areas with the minority population. So we immediately, as soon as we heard this, we got the video. And I was with them by the next day after Go Hall, I was interviewing the workers in the community in that community in the United States. And their reality, vision of reality, was totally different from what the media was saying. They all started talking about how it almost happened in their setting. And it was just a matter, they said, just a matter of accident that it didn't happen here, but it happened there. And I think within a week, we started traveling, getting the voices of workers and communities affected by Union Carbide. Um, and within a week or so, we had a video here, two weeks maybe, mm -hmm. and you translated it and you started showing it to across India. So that use of video to share people's stories and knowledge was very exciting at the time. And I was reflecting on that, and then we also published this report together, which uh, documenting in India and documenting around the world using the participatory research networks, documenting the experiences of communities affected by Union Carbide. And this report was uh, very <coughs> significant, not only because it was an important report, but it was the first time we had ever used internet to transfer data. I think we did it at a rate of 400 baud and it took about 24 hours to send this much text. <laughs> <laughs> Just to put it in perspective, so that. Yeah, in perspective. <laughs> and then we brought Rajesh Kane with a delegation from Priya and a delegation from Bhopal, and we did a person-to-person -person tour in the communities that had been um, also affected by this toxic production chain, and released a report <laughs> in yeah. the United States. So for me, that was a very important time. The visit in India was very important because it showed the international dimensions of the problems that I had been working on. But this, this incident was important not just because of the video of the joint research on a global scale, but because it showed that we had common problems in poor communities in the north, in poor communities in the south. These were common issues. And it's taken now 40 years now that the new social development goals have been announced and, and declared that development <laughs> is universal. And these development goals weren't about the different on the north telling the south that these were goals. These are universal goals. And that that we were always saying. And that we had to use our networks to share experiences. And one of the things I don't know what you feel about it, video is more common than ever. But I'm not sure that we're using it in the same way to mm -hmm. build international people, people together across the globe to discuss and share common problems and to build people to people exchanges yeah. at that grassroots level. This uh, this uh, no place to run, and we got CFC our neighbors also <coughs> work on it with us. Is the first. Now we realize that time we did it out of response. Mm -hmm. The first international collaborative effort of research and practice and action um, that we know of. Because prior to that, you had 
social movement network, the most common one in the 70s was the campaign against Nestle's baby food. Um, but it did not necessarily have research partnership with that. And then there were a few networks, you know, International Sociology Association, etc., which had academic sort of intent. But this was the first example of international collaboration where activists, workers, trade unionists, researchers are collaborating to present when we started presenting this, there was still confusion here about MIC. And by the way, this morning, uh, as I was thinking about our dialogue, and I read in the paper that some water was sprinkled in Delhi to reduce smog and pollution. Those of you who remember Bhopal, Dr. Balagaran was the scientific advisor to government of India at that time, and helicopters were dropping water in Bhopal, but MIC had already escaped and killed people. It was being done after a week. So smog had already killed and made people sick. And now we are sprinkling some tap water. So this is a totally irrational. Nobody knew what MIC was. Well, we have to ask you to tell us what MIC was. Well, this is also an important story about the use of freedom of information and what we call transparency for for empowerment. Yep. Because, like in many poorer communities in the United States, the doctor that Union Carbide employed there was an Indian doctor. And immediately, both what happened, they flew him back here to say, no, no, this has never happened in the United States. This could not. The theory was that this methylisocyanate under he became cyanide poisoning. And he flew him back and he denied this could ever happen. But in the United States, we had a very good Freedom of Information Act. And he even had to file documents about potential occupational health issues. And so we were able to get those documents signed by the same person, saying under conditions of high heat, this can decompose into cyanide poisoning. And you remember we were getting those documents with Freedom of Information. We were faxing them. Also, yeah. fax was still very new. Very new. We were faxing them to you, and you were putting them in the hands of the workers here. And then they were challenging the same doctor when he was lying to them in the means of public meetings. Mm -hmm. So that use of information and sharing information to empower people based on transparency and uh, freedom of information was also a very important thing we learned. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah, there was complete confusion. And later on, in the course of the same collaboration, we discovered that uh, manual of occupational health and safety in the Bhopal plant by Union Company was less stringent practices mm -hmm. than the one in the Institute West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And again, blaming the victim mm -hmm. as opposed to looking at the, And so that, that was the early days of our work on uh, occupational health and safety and it shaped the thinking that we must listen to the workers' experience and point of view because the medical doctors mm -hmm. appointed by the company will always tell you another story. Yeah. And we were fortunate at that time, if you remember, to find medical doctors and professionals in occupational health in locations like um, National Institute of Occupational Health, Dr. Sayer and Dr. Dave, who became lifelong partners. But they were able to share uh, expert knowledge in relation to workers' experience. And then you went on out of that experience of the sharing and to create this large occupational health program that Priya ran for, for many years and doing very important work around chemicals, around dust diseases, of, of, of <coughs> other, other areas. Let us uh, move to the next phase of our worked together in the late 80s and early 90s. As many of you know, we have begun to do a lot more work on capacity building. Capacity building of practitioners and new professionals, even government officials on how to promote authentic participation. And uh, there were a number of workshops that we organized by John and others. We invited John, came and spent a week doing those workshops together with us and you know some of you uh, 
you have seen these big volumes of reading materials that came out of those workshops. So that was a very important part of our investment and, uh, and your contribution in designing uh, learning opportunities such that participation was not limited to use of tools, but participation was seen as a as a value, as a uh, empowering uh, uh, sort of a lens, empowering uh, uh, goal. Now we had a, I remember a series of wonderful, there were week-long institutes mm -hmm. once they did, did with Priya and their partners came and we spent here looking at the meanings of participation and how you really put participation in, into practice. I think Navrata was the yeah, yeah. colleague here and everybody used this notion of reading, everybody had to read materials and we would come together and, and to discuss them. And you know, at the time this was very important because participation and development was becoming a, a big thing by the by the World Bank. And so even yeah. at that time we had this participation of the bank that produced this participation source book. But what would, did participation really mean? And I was I was pulling out some of the old slides, and there were transparencies the other day. And we talked at that time about, you know, in, in development in the 60s and 70s, participation was very much about the rights of the excluded to get voice in decisions. It was coming out of the post-colonial era to bring back power to people. But as it moved into to development, we used to talk about these meanings. Participation lost some of that. It became participation of the beneficiaries mm. of NGO programs. And if you think about beneficiary participation, there's something very different. It, it, it means you're still dependent on somebody else to give you something. Mm. And then you ask them, if I gave you it okay? It, means it wasn't about rights, it was about needs, it wasn't about upstream having voice, it was about downstream being a consumer of development and giving feedback. We were trying to challenge some of those meanings. And then along came the World Bank saying participation is important, and, but they used the term stakeholder participation. And in these very important debates, the early bank documents said the primary stakeholders are the poor and their participation is most but that word primary was later deleted. And so participation as stakeholder, I had a, a bank person tell me at one time then that well I got together the representative from the national NGO movement and the representative from the government and the representative from the Chamber of Commerce, the private sector, and we had lunch. So I had all the stakeholders and we had lunch, so that was participation. <laughs> and so we were really struggling and challenging that time, around that time to really bring participation back to its roots as being something around shift in power and, and, and true rights and voice and connected to the rights of, of citizenship. And that's when we held this very important meeting now. Yeah, we did. project that you led, that Priya was very involved in this World Bank Participation Network. We started, in fact, we were involved when the bank formulated its policy in 94. But very soon, uh, Priya was chairing the participation group in the NGO working group of the bank. And we realized that, uh, as John was saying, that participation could be co-optioned very quickly. And so we, we said we will take the best projects of the bank as determined by the bank. And we will look at the practice of participation from the point of view of primary stakeholders. And we did those studies around the world. And John had by that time moved into IDS uh, and we, he helped us synthesize lessons and then we held a sharing workshop in, in the World Bank office in Washington, D.C. where the issue of participation in programming and participation in policy, that distinction was brought out most centrally. And uh, that, that opened up a conversation in the bank as well as in our fraternity of civil society to go beyond the instrumentality of participation but to bring the voices in the formulation of policy itself. And that was a very, um, very important gathering of about 200 civil society people, uh, 
hosted inside the bank itself, mm -hmm. and we use these studies and other people's experiences and, and actually compile kind of a manifesto that Rajesh, you presented to Jim Wolfenson, yes. the president of the World Bank at the time, um, demanding that from civil society that participation be the stronger version of participation. And I was telling Rajesh this morning that um, I was back in May this year in the same room with another gathering of 200 civil society people from all over the world, and they were still talking about what does it mean <laughs> to have participation. Now they're using the word engagement. And the discourse has shifted, we'll come to this, from participation to accountability. And I was asked to reflect on there being differences 18 years, and there have been some, because then we were demanding that discourse be taken up. Now it is there, and nobody's using it. Mm. And I think we have a new research to do collectively. Last year, I didn't even know this until I was there, the bank ruled that 100% of their projects that is, their lending projects, 100% must show and demonstrate citizen engagement. Uh -huh. So that's what we were arguing for. But meanwhile, we don't quite have the same in geo monitoring groups. We're not monitoring it. They aren't putting it, they aren't monitoring it. But we have an opportunity to have a little bit of research made a big difference. And I think we have an opportunity collectively in other parts of the world to do a similar research in saying, is this monitor, is the bank putting into practice this requirement that civil society engagement in all of their lending programs and practices? And that's a very good point because after that, we moved on to our joint work on citizenship, yeah. you have seen, uh, from which a lot of experiences and perspectives on participation, accountability, and citizenship were gathered. And uh, over a 10 year period, we have a very strong Mm -hmm. and network and learning products. But somehow this point you make is very important that we, we, we need to return to the question of monitoring. Now that we have succeeded in having policy in place, mm -hmm. we need to come back and monitor the implementation of those policies. Because in the 90s, we were demanding policies. Yeah. And this is why we shift to the word accountability. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have some concerns about it because sometimes accountability is downstream. It's after the policies are made, we must hold the governments or institutions to account. The risk is that we forget the participation in upstream yeah. and only focus on accountability. But the good thing about accountability is that Jonathan Fox recently, who's writing a lot about this, talk, talks about its participation with teeth. Mm -hmm. That is, accountability is being able to give teeth to the voice that we want to have by being able to hold people to account for the decisions that are being made. And that's a new opportunity to really, because everybody's not talking about accountability, but they used to talk about participation. But, and of course Priya has done a lot of work around the tools of social accountability. But I think we're at time to say, okay, if you want gen true accountability, starts with participation in the beginning, Building people's voice and involvement all the way out through the policy process. But it also shows we must hold you account to account that that participation has actually made a difference. Right? So sometimes when we talk about participation, we used to talk about participation was voice. It's about the voice was being heard. Then it was participation about who gets elected, who comes in through the Panjati right, who, who sits at the table. But the stronger version of participation isn't just about voice and representation, it's about outcomes. Mm -hmm. And accountability is to say, we want to monitor whether the first two kinds of participation, voice and representation, <coughs> if they shift the power, if they change anything. And that, I think, is the strongest form of, of participation. I think this is a very critical stage in, in the work that we have all done over these years. Uh, the shift in the way participation has moved over the 40 years. We spent a lot of time in the 80s and 90s in collectivizing the voice. And then the local government experience in India and some other countries around the world, as you are aware, you know, representation of the marginalized and the rate of women, the Dalits, the tribals in 
positions of decision making came forward. But it does not necessarily mean that voice and representation results in outcomes which are supportive of the entitlements of the marginalized and excluded. And this issue requires now, I think, uh, concerted attention by us all. To, to ask the question in relation to outcomes. And uh, one of the difficulties in, in, in dealing with outcomes for accountability in a, in a formal sense is that you also have changing nature of political regimes and changing shifting nature of bureaucrats. So actually your decisions today, you can only measure outcomes five, seven years down the line. And uh, then institutional <coughs> Uh, capacity to respond becomes a challenge. Uh, would you would you say a, a few words about what has brought you here uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 quickly before we shall we stop? It's a long history, so it'll take us a long time to reflect. Yeah. Yeah. Let me do that. But before before I do that, I just want to say again, because we, we have to rush through it. That period from about 2000 to 2010 that we were able to work together partly because we had two large programs. Huh? We were supported by the Logo Link project, so the work that Priya was doing and we were doing around the world on strengthening participation in local governments. It was, I think, outstanding work on, on all sides because it took advantage of the moment of the new decentralization laws happening across the world, and we had the opportunity on a global scale to document and share. And in the series of reports that we did under this citizenship program, including the book that you and I co-authored on globalizing citizens, that work produced over 200 outputs that are yeah. constantly still being used around the world and, and referred to. And you know, then we again we were pushing that this word participation needed to shift to the notion of citizenship because not citizenship as a person with a passport. But citizenship as a human being with rights and citizen engagement in democracy was, was critical in there. And, so on. and now, much, and then DFID and donors, they said, no, we don't want to use that language. But now they're all talking about citizen engagement. And they're all talking about what difference this big program made of shifting the discourse, yeah. if not the reality. But you know, I have become, over the years, I, and this brings me why I'm here. Um, I've had the privilege the last year of working with a big project between the International Social Science Council um, and IDS to produce something called the World Social Science Report. So every three years they produce a World Social Science Report. And this year the report is on inequality and social justice. And I was a co-editor and this uh, very important because we brought together over 100 authors from 40 countries from all disciplines and activists and journalists to talk about this growing problem of extreme inequality. So we, we launched this on September 22nd. I'll leave a copy in the library. It's also all, all online if you go. It's, it's all online. But I've got a couple of pieces on in here which <coughs> which I've been thinking about most as a participation activist. I had to ask myself at a certain point, why is it that after 40 years of our work on citizen participation, economic inequality is still leading around the world? And that's not only a problem because inequality affects everybody's life, but it's a problem because economic inequality translates to concentration of power in certain hands, and that power can then trump our efforts at participation. <coughs> so we can spend all of our time building voice and participation in the political sphere, in the social sphere, and meanwhile the concentration of power in the economic sphere is having ultimately more effect on our lives. <coughs> so I've become to, I've been, it's caused me to rethink quite a lot, and I, I think as particip people concerned about participation now, we have to come back and re-engage on economic issues and how people get participation in the economic decisions that affect their lives. Some of those are back where we started. They're around land and control of natural resources. Some of it's around 
uh, workers and workers' rights. Some of it's around creating alternative economies and alternative forms of, of economic development. Some of it's around the things that Korea has done on urban development and, and holding economic development actors and industrial boards. Uh, but the challenge we face is that most donors, most NGOs, separated. They have their economic livelihood division and their growth program here. And then they have their citizen participation and governance program here. And maybe they have their women's empowerment program over here. But we somehow have to bring all of these together. So that's the, in this message we talk about, in this report we talk about the growth of inequality around the world. But the last third of this book is about what can we do about it. And it reminds us that it's not inevitable, that change can be made. And we talk about seven forms of inequality. Economic inequality, social inequality, political inequality, which is not inequality of voice, cultural inequality, spatial inequality between rural and, and urban, environmental inequality. And the last and most important is knowledge inequalities. And this again takes us right back to where we started. We argue that unless we can equalize the voices who are experiencing inequality, unless we can bring those voices in, then we're not going to be able to develop a strategy of, of really dealing with global inequality. 80%, we point out, of the published scientific knowledge on inequality in the last 20 years has come from the United States and Western Europe. And yet 80% of the people at the bottom of the inequality ladder, even more, live in other countries. So there's a deep disparity of knowledge about inequality. And our organizations like us, going back to our roots of participatory research, have to, to reclaim the knowledge about how inequality is affected <coughs> and what can we do about it. And so for me, this is important. For me, one of the key issues more as we think, take our participation work forward in the next decade. Well, thanks. This is very helpful because it <clears throat> points us to what needs to be done. <clears throat>